I'm in the process of repairing and restoring this reperforator. It's a very old machine, it's for making uh, punched paper tapes. And um, so far in this series, I've dismantled the unit. Now, I started this about a year ago, so it's been sitting waiting to uh, be repaired for a while. And uh, the first repair was to weld up this broken uh, front surround. So I've now done that and I can start moving on to the actual uh, mechanics. So I've been working on this on and off, so I have shot some videos for the repair of certain parts of it already. Uh, and I'll post those later. Now, in response to the videos I've posted recently on this, I had uh, one commenter say that uh, he didn't know what a reperforator was, so perhaps I should explain it. Um, if you want to know what a reperforator is, just type reperforator into Google. Or you can go back and watch the first video in this series, or alternatively you can continue to watch these videos and it will hopefully all become clear by the time this is up and running. There's little value in me trying to explain uh, what this does and how it works when it's not working. It's better to wait until it starts to function. So if you want to know what a reperforator is, just keep watching these videos. So the next step in getting this working, I've got the chassis up to the point now where it's ready to start accepting the components back onto it. But the next step is actually the most, uh, it's complex but not difficult and it's time consuming and that's to deal with the encoder. So I'll get that onto the bench and we'll start dismantling it and figuring out what work it needs. So this is the encoder mechanism, and uh, I've explained how these work in previous videos, but just to recap uh, very briefly, there are a series of encoder bars, and there's one of these for each bit of the information. So uh, you've probably seen paper tape. There's a series of punched holes, all in rows, and each one of these encoder bars is responsible for determining if there should be a hole in a particular position for a particular character. And uh, the way this works is very simple. And when you press a key down, it effectively puts one of these bars down into the encoder bars. And we'll have a look at the encoder bars once I've taken them out. But the encoder bars themselves have a series of uh, stops and slots cutting them. And depending on which key you press down, it will stop the encoder bars in one of two positions when the machine tries to punch the paper tape. And uh, that's how it encodes the data. It's just really all the encoding is done by the encoder bars. And depending on which key you press, it will determine the position of the bars. And you'll see how that works once we start taking this apart. Now at the moment, uh, these should all slide freely. So the end one is, is kind of moving, it's a bit sticky. The third one in will also move, but the rest are seized up. They won't move at all. So we need to get them out and clean them. It would probably be possible to clean these and get it working um, with this still assembled, but um, because I'm kind of doing a restoration, I want to take this apart. I want to clean all these keys anyway. I'm not going to go mad and take the caps off, uh, but I do want to get them a lot cleaner than they are, and also several of them are bent, so I need to straighten them out. Um, as I said, a very straightforward uh, mechanism. There are some complications. Some have um, multiple encoder hooks, so they've got these hooks on that go over this bar, so we need to make sure we get everything back in the right place. So if you're not familiar with the order these are in, just take a photograph or take some notes. Um, but uh, also bear in mind that not all the slots are used, so some of these slots will be empty, so just bear that in mind when you're reassembling it. If you get it in the wrong slot, it will have a tendency to jam up, and also you'll get weird characters because the uh, encoder bars won't be uh, stopped in the correct locations. Okay, so the first thing we need to do to get this apart, you can get these out just by uh, lifting them and sliding them forward and you can just slide them out. But because I want to take the entire thing apart, I'm just going to take this crossbar out. I can then unhook it, lift it out, and then all the keys will lift out. So I'll just get the two screws out that hold that in place, get the bar out of the way, and then we can start removing the uh, key bars. I've taken the two screws out that hold this bar in place. I've unhooked the three keys that have the uh, wire hooks on them, and this will now just lift out and we can put it to one side. It will need cleaning, you can see it's fairly rusty. Um, 
One thing, as I said before, if you're not familiar with um, these assemblies and you don't have any documentation, keep fairly careful uh, notes. It is important that you get the hooks back in the right place, otherwise you might get um, erratic behaviour of some of the keys. Okay, so we'll get the bar out of the way. And what we can now do is just lift these out. So they, they're in a slot, but they will just lift out of the guides. And all we need to do is take them all out. I'll get these all out of the way. Now, some of them are just um, link bars. They don't have a key on the end. And at the front, there's a little fork. You can disengage that with the lever. That's for these keys here. And then you can lift out the cross piece and um, you can get it out of the way. If we do the next one, you'll see that if we put these side by side, they are identical, so it doesn't matter which of these we put in which of those locations, they are the same. It's just a link bar. It doesn't do anything other than um, hold down a particular um, block of characters, especially like things like shift and that sort of thing. So it doesn't matter which order we keep these in. I will keep them in the same order, um, just to uh, be precise, but uh, in theory, if we mix these up, it shouldn't matter. Uh, you do need, of course, to put the, um, the keys, the character keys, back in the right place and make sure that if there was a hook on it, uh, that you fit those back onto the correct keys later. So we can take all these out now. They will just lift out. Okay, and then we have one more of the link bars on this side. And once again, if we compare this with the other ones, you'll see, hopefully you can see that they are identical. So as I said, it doesn't matter which order you put these in, but I will put them back in the same locations that I took them off. But as I said, if you do mix them up, um, those three don't really matter. Okay, that's all the keys removed. You can see that uh, they're not in terrible condition, but they do need cleaning and uh, some need to be straightened out. This little tab here is for the return spring. So there's a spring um, that sits on the, underneath this and pushes this up and uh, it pivots at this end. So there's a spring and it, it's what uh, holds the key up. We'll look at the springs in another video. Uh, next thing to do is remove the encoder bars. Now on this particular machine, you can't really mix them up because if we look at the, the end, you'll see that they're different heights, where these, the top is the same, but the uh, position of the dog leg bend is different, so they're all in sequence, so it wouldn't be really possible to mix them up, other than the front ones. So there's one at the front, this is just the kind of stop position uh, encoder bar, uh, and that one would go in any of the positions, but then you couldn't fit the others, so in theory we can't put it back together incorrectly. Uh, however, there should be a number on the back of each of these. We take the first one out, then on the back of it, there should be a number. So here we are, 92, and there should be a different number on the back of each one. Now, the way these work, as I said, is when you press the key, it moves down into these uh, cutouts, and then depending on um, the nature of the uh, cutout, it will determine where the encoder bar will stop, whether it stops to the right or whether it stops to the left. And if we look at different encoder bars, you'll see that, well, that first one is fairly simple. If we look at this one, hopefully you can see that the cutouts are mostly uh, all different. And again, depending on where the uh, cutout is, will determine where the encoder bar can stop when you press a key. So some it will stop like this one to the left and on this one it will stop to the right. So it allows the um, encoder bars position to be determined by the individual keys and then the sequence of encoder bars is determined by the combination of slots that have been machined into them. So if you look uh, through the encoder bars, if you stack them all up, you can see which ones would be where based on which particular slot the uh, key bar passes through. So it's very clever. It works in exactly the same way as uh, pretty much every one of this type of system built around that time. So SR33, for example, that you're probably all familiar with, works in a very similar way. This has got a number 79 on the back. And so we can take all these out. 
item at 78, 77, 76. Okay, so that's the encoder bars. They obviously need cleaning. They're covered in this sand and some congealed grease. We've now got this last bar at the front. So this is the kind of stop, the, the, the stop bar. This is what um, determines if the keys are allowed to go down. So depending on whether this is left or right will determine whether a particular key is allowed to go down. So if it's lined up, so if one of these tabs, if you can see them, you've got these tabs here, if they're lined up with the key, the key cannot be pressed down because the key is sitting on top, but if it's uh, moved across, the key can go down. So that enables the system to block the use of certain keys. And uh, the only thing you need to do with this is make sure A, it goes at the front, and B, it goes in the right way round. So I'll just take that out. Just need to slacken off the screw that holds it in place. Okay, that's the locking clamp removed. Also slackened off the screw at the bottom uh, that clamps that down. And now we can just lift this out and as I said, make sure it goes back in the right way round. If you put it in backwards, it's not going to work. On this particular one, the writing is at the back, so we can't mix it up. So that's all the encoder bars out. Okay, so the next thing we need to do is to get this uh, bar out that carries the uh, keys, the front row of keys. Uh, they're on springs, so uh, we need to be careful to get those back in the right place. And to get this out, all we need to do is to remove this uh, screw. It's got a washer that sits into a groove on this shaft. And when we take this out, we can just slide the shaft out. So I'll just get this screw out of the way. Okay, and it's got this large washer that sits in the recess or the groove on this shaft. We should now be able to push this out and remove it. Just lift off, which it does. So. So what we can do with this is just slacken off the locking screws. There's um, nothing really critical in aligning this other than the relative position of the arm and the key. And all you need to do is, if they're separate, such as this one and this one, this is driven through the shaft itself, is make sure that when you put them on, they're in line. So if you look down, the kind of length of the machine. This pin should be central to the carrier for the key. Uh, just make sure that when you put it on you get them lined up. Uh, also you can do it by putting it on the bench and um, they should, if you put a uh, plate under this, they should be uh, parallel. So the bottom edge of this should be parallel to the bottom edge of this. The other ones you can't mix up because it's all one piece. Uh, all you need to do is make sure you get them in the correct relative position. But you can adjust them once they're in. You don't need to uh, uh, reassemble it first. Or you can photograph it or measure it. It's entirely up to you. But make sure when you reassemble it, you get the springs in the right place. Otherwise, you'll have to dismantle the entire thing again. OK, so I put it to one side. Just needs cleaning up. And that just leaves us with the chassis. So I don't need to dismantle this any further. This is as far as we need to go with this. Uh, we do need to make sure it's all cleaned and freed up. So I'll give this a really good clean as usual. Uh, get rid of all the sand that's on it. Um, I'm not going to be blast it or anything like that. It's in fairly good condition as far as I can tell. So I think it will clean up fairly well. I don't think the uh, finish, it's, it's a black finish, it's not paint. I don't think it's going to need uh, refinishing. So I'll try and be fairly careful to not damage that. Uh, all the rest of it is just uh, really a case of cleaning it up. Now, don't throw these into evapor rust or something like that because evapor rust will remove this uh, this finish. Uh, it's an oxide finish, and if you put it into evapor rust, evapor rust is very good at removing oxide, and it will turn all these to bare metal, and then they'll rust. Uh, you'll come back uh, two days later, and you'll have a big pile of rust. Uh, and the thing will seize up within uh, weeks. So um, it needs cleaning, but uh, what I will use for this to start with at least is detergent, put them in the parts washer, and then probably just polish up the cap, make sure they're all straight, and um, then I can start reassembling. 
it's, it's a fairly easy thing to work on. As you can see, there's not a great deal to it. It's just really keeping everything in order and making sure you put it all back together uh, in the correct sequence and everything's in the right place. The actual work of uh, cleaning this is just tedious. So I won't uh, bore you with the details. This will probably take me a day to get all these parts cleaned. So we'll come back and in the next video, we'll start to reassemble all this.